Thanks everyone for joining. Today we have Dave Baggett. Um, Dave is the founder and CEO of Inky. Inky's flagship product, Inky Fish Fence, uses computer vision and other machine learning techniques to identify and block phishing emails. Uh, phishing is arguably the biggest problem in cybersecurity today, driving over $1.5 billion a year of theft and extensive PII, personal identi personally identifiable information, and credential theft. Prior to Inky, Dave was co-founder and CEO of travel search provider ITA Software, where he oversaw software development, operations, and customer relations, expanding the company to over 500 employees. Google acquired ITA for $700 million in April of 2011. Dave has a BS, BA in computer science and, and linguistics from the University of Maryland, College Park, and an SM in computer science from MIT. Dave also volunteers as a member of the U.S. Department of Energy Secretary Advisory Board on Artificial Intelligence. Uh, so if, you, if you've heard of Dave before, it might be because they recently raised, Inky, uh, raised $20 million from Insight Partners. And also, as Dave and I were just chatting about, uh, he is the co-creator of a game that you all may love, uh, Crash Bandicoot. Uh, Dave, thanks for, thanks for joining us today. Absolutely. You gave me a bit of a promotion. I was COO at ITA, not CEO. I was Chief ah, Operating see. Officer, but, but definitely was one of the, the co-founders. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so, Dave, you guys at Inky have a pretty interesting pivot story. Um, can you take us back to 2008 when you, when you started the company, um, how you came up with the idea, and, and then that moment when you decided a, a pivot would be the best, the best move for you? Yeah, well, we made multiple pivots, in fact, okay. uh, and, and I think this is really common among startups. You always hear about startups raising a ton of money and looks like an overnight success, but it's generally product, unless you just get really lucky and find something with product market fit in the beginning, it's just trying and trying and trying stuff. So I would say we had at least four pivots, if not five, but the, the thought behind uh, Inky in the beginning was, um, you know, just about the time we were getting ready to sell the company to Google. You know, I really wanted the, the ITA company, the travel tech company. I really mm -hmm. wanted to, I was thinking about how to replicate that kind of success, a SaaS business um, in something that wasn't just a vertical. So vertical meaning, you know, travel or retail. Obviously ITA was, was about travel tech, so it was travel vertical. I wanted to do something that was broader, so more, more horizontal. And so I liked the email space for that reason. I also liked the email space because it just says such a huge addressable market. If you think about, you know, one of the back of the envelope ways we thought about ITA in the beginning was there's over 2 billion airplane trips that people take a year. And if you could monetize each one of those trips, that's a good revenue stream. You know, in a similar way, we look at mailbox count and we say, well, there's a billion, a billion and a half enterprise corporate mailboxes out there. Um, you monetize each one of those, that's a good revenue stream. So I was always intrigued by the market size. And I also felt like email was a really fraught space. Um, it hadn't really been solved in the sense of usability. Um, and remember, this is 2008. So this is right around the time the iPhone came out. It wasn't a great security story. Uh, so there were just a lot of things that seemed like kind of broken with email. But I also firmly believed that we would have email forever. You know, even, yeah. even as early as 2010, people were talking about Email's dead, everyone's gonna use Facebook. And I never believed that. And indeed, like mailbox counts just gone up continuously since 1971 when the first email was sent. So the, the pivot story is really one of, we did a lot of foundational work and I ran the, ran Inky really as kind of almost an incubator. And we just tried a bunch of different stuff. We, we wrote our own mail client. We wrote, it was an app, you know, you could use on the phone. We worked a lot on really rapid searching of large mail archives you know, instant search as you type. We worked on extracting semantics from mail so you could search your mail by hashtags, like some cool stuff like that around usability. Um, and then, you know, over the course of that decade, from 2008 until let's say 2015 or so, it became really clear there wasn't really any oxygen left in the room for consumer mail plays. You know, basically like people just wanted to use the app that came on their phone. So it was either Gmail on Android, or they're going to use the iPhone, iMail, you know, iOS mail app on the uh, on the Apple phones. So I, we really thought about we got to do something where we're targeting companies, 
And, okay. you know, initially that was, the, it was definitely going to be around security. We looked at things like making end-to-end -end encryption easier, um, things like that. But ultimately, as I was talking to CIOs and CISOs about the encryption product, they're like, well, that's interesting, but what I really care about is phishing. Mm. And, you know, so even as early as 2015, 2016, phishing, email phishing was a hair on fire issue for the CISOs and CIOs. And they were clearly articulating that as much as you might believe that the incumbent mail protection systems, which by the way, have been around since the nineties, right. as much as you would believe they've solved the problem, you know, these CIOs and CISOs are saying, no, we're getting fished through all the time. It's not solved. So that really opened our eyes to the opportunity there. And then we had this huge toolbox of stuff that we'd written since 2008 that we could sort of put together. And although we didn't, we didn't end up having an app, we ran a lot of the same code and we still do in the cloud. Okay. And, and can you talk a little bit about that process of, of product discovery, right? You're speaking with CIOs, CISOs. Um, how did you connect with those folks? Um, you know, as a, as a, as someone who had a consumer product first and pivoting to more of an enterprise product, how do you connect with those people to get those insights to then to, to, to develop a product? Yeah, there's, there's the rub. <laughs> it's really <laughs> hard. You know, if you're a startup and no one knows who you are, by definition, it's hard to get in touch with these folks, especially people like CISOs who are, who are quite literally potentially the busiest, most overscheduled people in any enterprise now. So we basically had to build an MVP of something that was interesting enough to them to want to take a look at and take a call. So I don't know that if we just speculatively we went out and tried to get calls with CISOs to ask them for advice, whether we would have gotten a single one agreeing to help us. Now, right. one interesting aspect of this, though, which I learned is when you jump verticals like I did, when you move from one sector to another, like video games in my case, and then travel tech and then cyber, you're basically resetting a lot of the value you build back to zero. So for example, if after ITA, I had done something else within the travel tech space. I would have been able to have conversations with dozens of executives in that space because they all right. knew me from ITA and trusted me. But coming into cyber, I was a complete newcomer. So I think really the only way you might be able to bridge that without making an MVP is bring on a partner or you know a co-founder or hire somebody who has that kind of reputation who you know, they'll at least get the meetings and the calls with the people you want to talk to, to help you flesh out your idea. You know, now it's great because we have a significant, significant enough customer base that we can talk to our customers now at Inky about some, you know, new area. Hey, what are your right. pain points? And they're really happy to talk to us, but without that relationship, it's hard. And that's a really tough thing to start from zero on. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the things that uh, we find very interesting when people have uh, product ideas. It's, you know, have you talked to folks who have this pain point? Uh, because obviously you want to be, especially, you know, when you're thinking about AI, right, you want to be building products that people will actually use and, and pay for. And so, yeah, I like that, that approach you took in terms of just, you know, let's have these conversations. Let's make sure that we start off on the right foot and build something that's, that's marketable. Uh, for something we could take to market it and, and make money on um, versus building a, you know, a cool app or a cool product. Yeah. And, you know, going back to your question um, about the pivots, I think the absolute hardest thing you can do as a startup is find that initial product market fit. I think it's essentially impossible to do that unless you get lucky or try over and over and over again. And I've never right. found that I or anybody else I've worked with has any particular intuition about this. So you know, number one, getting that kind of feedback from potential customers. And even how you do that is really important and challenging, but it's also important not to get discouraged because you're probably not going to be Sergey and Larry and the first idea yeah. you have is worth a trillion dollars, <laughs> right? It's probably not going right. to have that kind of, it, it's just very, very rare that you have a, a an opportunity like that. So, you know, at, at at Naughty Dog, we made a game, right? So we didn't know it was going to be the Sony mascot game. We just made a game. The fact that it turned into Sony's mascot game was kind of luck and timing. At ITA, we saw this need for a better flight search. But what really made that company valuable was the fact that we were doing that exactly in the time period when all of ticket sales moved from human travel agents to online in a five-year uh, period. 
Yeah. Now, if you looked at the beginning of ITA, 95% of tickets were sold by human travel agents, probably higher than that. If you looked at five years into ITA, it was exactly the reverse. Like so you're kind of being sold online. Yeah, sit your product on top of a, a, a wave of growth, right? Yep. Which gave you some more flexibility in terms of experimentation. Exactly. And I think, you know, in the startup press, there's a lot of back analysis like, oh, we knew that was going to happen and we were geniuses. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's rarely true, though. I think actually usually people are, you know, behind the scenes struggling to find the right product that people will actually buy. And then those hyper growth stories, you know, it's not that they're not intentional. In some sense, obviously, the startup has to do the right things and execute properly and think strategically. But when they become a massive hyper growth story, there's often an element of luck and timing there, too. Yeah. Okay. So, so when you had the product built or the MVP, the MVP built, and you were going to use that as a way to have these conversations, how do you go from that to actually getting uh, the conversation with the CISO or the CIO? Yeah, well, there it's a matter of exactly the kind of prospecting you would do with the real product, right? You just send a lot of emails. You, you know, we found LinkedIn was really effective. You know, you just have to find the mechanism that the person you're trying to reach will react to. You know, mm -hmm. email's probably not as great anymore as it was, you know, 10 years ago. LinkedIn's really, really effective now. Um, it probably won't be forever. And, and so there is this sort of constantly staying abreast of how to reach people, what the, what the narrative is, you know, how to approach them. I mean, I think CISOs are an interesting group to try to target because, you know, they're just so bombarded by vendors um, especially when they hear like AI or machine learning, they're like, oh, brother, you know, it's like snake oil to them. <laughs> they're yeah. totally bombarded. And a lot of the stuff isn't real and they know that. So they're kind of a cynical group. So, okay. you know, we found that if you just go out and try to hit up a CISO for a call to sell them something, it's just not going to work. You have to sort of offer something that's interesting, an opportunity to talk about something they care about that's not obviously a sales pitch. So it's partly about crafting a pitch that isn't really just a pure pitch but right. conveys something about the fact that they might get something out of talking to you. They might learn something, um, you know, and there's obviously an art to this, but there's also just constantly iterating. Try. I mean, we basically try all kinds of different ways to format emails and what we put in the emails and what they look like and okay. then measure which ones work well. It's just, but you know, ultimately it comes down to a numbers game, right. In your outreach and, and varying the message, you know, testing the message to see wh which one hits. Um, yeah, and being creative about what you think they might want to hear about. Yeah. And, you know, like fishing is an interesting topic for people. So I think in that case, it was not hard once we decided to work on fishing to get people to talk to us because that was a burning need for them. So there is sort of a right. feedback effect, right? As you start to learn, here's the pain point. You also get more uptake and people wanting to talk to you about that thing because that's the thing they're worried about. Yeah. Okay, so that's a that's a good segue. I, I want to talk more about uh, Inky, your, your your core product, and you know after you you go into that, would love to hear, um, you know how how a user would or an enterprise is using this. So give us a kind of a, a better picture of how this looks in the real world. Sure. Yeah, and if you think about cybersecurity, really the first use of AI in cybersecurity was spam filtering way back in the 90s. So the architecture of our system is still similar to those early systems in that, you know, mail comes in from the internet, it hits something called the MX server, which is basically the front door for the mail system to the internet. And that's usually run by Microsoft or Google, one of the ecosystem providers. Sometimes it's provided, sometimes it'll be run by an incumbent mail protection vendor. Proofpoint's a big one, Mimecast is a big one, they're both public companies. Mm -hmm. But the mail comes in and then we're usually the next step after that. So we set up, we help the customer, and often this is just totally automated, but we set it up so that after that MX receives the mail, it comes over to Inky. And then Inky servers that we run, look at the mail for you know usually a couple seconds and perform various kinds of analyses, like all different uses of different kinds of AI, but also things that are just sort of heuristics and comes up with essentially a set of scores like how fishy does this look? You know, does this look like a brand forgery, a fake Microsoft mail? Does it look like the fake mail from Dave? It's not really from Dave, but it looks like it's from Dave. You know, classifying the mail in terms of what, what how, how does it appear and how, and is it unsafe? Then it goes right back into Microsoft or Google's ecosystem 
And both of those both of those mail systems have rules you can set up that say, you know, if this header was added, then move it to quarantine. Right. We're just leveraging that same right. stuff in this case. And then if the mail's safe, it gets delivered. And the key thing that we do to change that user experience, you know, the radically different thing that we've added to the user experience, you know, what the end user sees is this idea that, hey, you know, it's it's not so useful to be binary about this and just say okay. the mail's either good or it's bad. It's a lot better to have a middle category where you say, look, it doesn't really look like the kind of mail Dave would write, but right. you know, maybe it is him. We don't know. We can't prove it's not from him. So what do so instead of pretending in that case like we can be perfect, we just say, hey, here's the mail. We put a yellow banner on the mail. We literally inject this banner right at the top of the mail. And you okay. see this all over the place. People put in a little tag that says external. Mm -hmm. The banner is like that, except for giving useful information, not just external, but like, hey, this doesn't look like normal mail from Dave. And then it gets delivered. So when the user sees it on their phone or on their desktop, they see that banner. And that gives them guidance about, about the mail. And that, that helps a lot. It makes people slow down and gives them almost like real time advice and training about that mail. Got it. Got it. And, and where does, I guess, well, when you, when you came to market with this product, was it with AI? Did you already have the AI um, components built in? Yeah. Um, and if so, how did you, I mean, did you build it yourself or did you bring on someone uh, who, who helped you to build that out? Well, yeah, it's, it was conceived as an AI based product from the beginning. Okay. And mm -hmm. the genesis of the, of the phishing product was, as I mentioned, we talked to CISOs and CIOs and they said, fish is getting through. So I had hired a chief scientist who, who got his PhD at university of Wisconsin, Madison, which is a great machine learning school. And he had done his thesis on semi-supervised learning. His name's Andrew. So Andrew had been with us in the incubator period for a long time. Okay. And, you know, my background, you know, so his background was statistical machine learning. You know, a lot of what you're seeing now is that's working in, in, in real world systems. My background was more natural language processing at the okay. AI lab at MIT. That's what I did there. But we basically said to each other, well, look, there's this problem of phishing. What exactly is phishing? We decided, well, phishing is really about forgery. It's about you, the victim gets a mail they think is from a brand they trust, but it isn't or they think it's from a person they trust and it isn't. In both cases, it's forgery, it's impersonation. And so we thought about from the beginning, well, how would you, how would you just doing any, any just blue sky, how would you solve this problem with a machine? And the first realization was, it's kind of a two-step process for a human to try to do this, right? The first mm -hmm. thing that you do as a human recipient is, your brain does some computation you're not even aware of that tells you who the apparent sender is. So you get this mail you've never seen before and it has like a Microsoft office logo or something and something in your brain is triggered that says, Oh, Microsoft, I know that's a brand I know. Right. So this idea of identifying the apparent sender seemed really important. And it was obvious you're going to have to use computer vision stuff to do that. You know, you're going to have to look at the imagery. Clearly the human is looking at stuff like imagery and colors and text and right. layout features. One insight we had pretty early was, you can't just look for an image that's brand indicative and say that means it's impersonating that brand. What if it's a Facebook logo at the lower right corner and it's tiny? That doesn't mean it's right. impersonating Facebook. It's just like, and your brain just does this automatically. You don't even know why, but your brain says, ah, oh, that's not a Facebook. Um, that's just like us on Facebook, right? Right. So it started out as really this blue sky blank sheet of paper. Can we make a forgery detector for email? And we basically had two kinds of approaches and we pursued them in parallel. One was this idea of using computer vision stuff that had been done in academia in the 2010s, which everybody knows about right. now, like deep learning models to recognize imagery. In, in the literature, most of that deep learning stuff is about photographic imagery, like is this a picture of a cat, right? right. Um, right. Our setting is a bit different, but we believed correctly, in retrospect, we believed that we could apply that work to the setting of, well, it's an HTML mail and it's not just a photograph, but probably similar stuff would work. And that turned out to be true. And that helps us identify the brand forgery mails, the mail that look like they're from the leading brand that you know and trust. For the person forgery case, you know, there's not a lot of visual stuff in mail right. written by humans. They're just typing, right? So they're it was clear we'd have to use more anomaly detection algorithms also from the 2010s, but the idea being, could we establish kind of a baseline profile for every sender? What are their, what does their normal mail look like? 
and then look for deviations against that norm. So after Inky sees five or 10 examples of your male, Inky has a pretty good idea what your normal male looks like from various standpoints. And it can say, look, look, it doesn't look like the normal male from Dave, but maybe that's not definitive, but it has a pretty good sense, right? And that sort of led us into the idea of also, let's also communicate more transparently with the user about what the model's telling us. Because, right. you know, as, as everybody listening here knows, the big bane of machine learning and AI is false positives, right? Or false negatives. Like, what if it's wrong? Right. Well, it was clear you can't always be right in this case. Like, even a perfect human cannot identify whether a male's really from a given sender perfectly. So instead of trying to pretend we could solve that problem, we sort of found a third way of just tell them what we know. And that's turned out to be really effective in making people trust the system. Okay. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And I know uh, fishing is a huge thing now, you know, even my experience in, in investing, right? You had, you had phishing attacks. And I remember getting an email from um, one of our principals uh, and it said, Hey, look, I'm, I'm sitting here with a client. I mean, these emails are, they seem so real oh, yeah. that if you just look for a split second, you think it's real. You think, mm -hmm. you think there's no way that, I mean, you don't even process that it could be fake. And so the email that I received was, hey, I'm sitting here with a client. Um, I need your login details for X, Y, Z so I can do, you know, and it seemed, you know, if, if we weren't going through phishing exercises at that right. time, I would have never thought it, that, that um, I would fall victim to that. And I think, you know, a lot of people, when they hear of phishing, they think of kind of the, the scams where, you know, people are targeting older people, but this really is an issue that happens with, you know, it doesn't matter your intelligence level. The, some of these attacks, these phishing attacks are, are very believable. Yeah, and, and the really scary thing that I realized sort of embarrassingly long, late into the process of us solving this problem was, oh, wait, you know, if I'm an attacker and I want you to think of Microsoft, what's the easiest way I do that? I just take a real mail that I got from Microsoft, edit one link and send that. <laughs> it's right. identical to the real Microsoft mail. I don't have to do any work styling it or creating any artwork. I just take the real mail. In fact, yeah. I literally got one. I posted it on LinkedIn today. I, I got one today that Inky identified as an Apple brand impersonation, which was basically a perfect looking iCloud mail. Okay. Totally fake. You know, it's a scam, credential harvesting scam or credit card. I didn't go to see what it was, but, but it looks, looks totally real. I mean, so the visuals are now trivial for the attackers to replicate pixel perfect. They just copy right. the HTML. It's the same HTML. It's going to look the same, right? And I imagine these days, you know, in times of crisis, um, scams go up. So right now you're probably, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're probably seeing phishing also. Uh, go up, which is which is good for you guys in the, in the sense that you have more opportunities to to help your customers. Yeah, we've seen tri we've seen phishing nearly triple since the beginning of the pandemic, and that's just phishing across the board. We've also seen over and classified over fifty different kinds of COVID related phishing, mm. some of which are as nasty as they'll send mail to one of our customers and they'll mimic the branding of that customer and they'll say one of your employees died of COVID, click here to read the details of how to protect yourself. Um, so this stuff's nasty. And it's, and it's, it's kind of like what we see every year around holiday time, we see a lot of gift card scams, because people are buying stuff online, and the attackers right. know to take advantage of that distraction. It's the same thing. They know people are afraid. And they're busy, and they're distracted. Maybe their kids sitting next to them asking them when lunch is because they're working from home. Mm -hmm. So the attackers have been targeting the pandemic right. specifically. And yeah, so, so the interesting thing is, is, you know, from what I've seen, they tend to see, send highly relevant emails on current events, which can, can yep. really trick, you know, the receiver of that email. Um, what's the business impact when this, um, when this goes wrong? Yeah, I mean, arguably, it's the biggest problem in cybersecurity, which is one reason that we were attracted to it. You know, obviously, we started in mail, but what aspect of mail? Well, phishing. It's kind of phishing is the thing that drives the most theft of money. And you, at least in U.S. businesses, like you quoted the FBI stat, it's close to $2 billion a year of wire fraud. We also see other ways that, you, that the attackers can steal money from you. Gift card scams, like You'll get a mail that looks like it's from your head of marketing. Hey, I need you to go to the Apple store and buy gift cards and tell me the numbers. 
that's like giving somebody money, right? If you give right, them right. the numbers, <laughs> so don't do that. Um, yeah. But that's sort of a secondary way that the attackers can steal money. And then, you know, there's reputational damage from things like theft of personally identifiable information. There are cases where, you know, we've had someone, we've seen cases in the media talked about where someone will say like, hey, can you send me all the W-2s for everyone in the company? And the person uh, sends like 10,000 W-2s. Like, yeah. Gets to the matter, right? um, yeah. And then there's, you know, there's just good old fashioned credential harvesting. And a lot of these brand forgery emails, like the fake iCloud mail that I mentioned, the fake Microsoft mail, a lot of those will lead you to a page that appears to be a login page for that service. And then guess what? You type in your password into that thing. You just gave it to the attacker. So, right. and then what do they do with that? Well, they can use it to fish other people if it's a mail account. They can also camp out on the account. Let's say they get access to your Office 365 account. They can secretly log into that thing without you knowing, watch the traffic, and then when something happens, pounce on it. So we see a lot of real estate scams where consumer real estate transactions are intercepted by attackers that have gotten into the accounts where they wow. redirect the wire money to pay for the house. Wow. And wow. so, you know, there's just innumerable ways this can harm you. And the problem is it's so easy and so cheap for the attackers to do this. Right. Cost them nothing to send out millions of emails, like literally nothing. Yeah, yeah, okay. And you know, what I'd like to understand is the customer conversations you have, right? Um, so, you know, if you could take us back to the early days um, of this particular product for Inky, mm -hmm. um, you know, what was the process for acquiring that first customer? And then with you guys being an, an AI solution, was that a part of the conversation? Um, and, and what was that conversation like? Oh yeah, absolutely. So the way we approach it really is consultative. I mean, in the 2020s now, sales isn't just pitching your product. It's more mm -hmm. about trying to understand, does the product we have add value to you, the potential customer? and helping them figure that out without it, without trying to bias it towards selling them something they don't need, right? So in our case, it's about, you know, what, if anything, do you use now? If they have an incumbent vendor, that's fine. We just wanna know. And then are you seeing fish get through and then what kinds? And so usually, you know, since fishing is so rampant, usually the answer to that second question is yes. And then we sort of walk them through about, you know, here's the kinds of fish that get through the other systems here's some intuition about why we're able to catch them. And we talk a bit about how we use machine learning in a way that's not super technical, but just gives them some intuition that, oh yeah, I could see how that would work. I mean, I'm sure it's complicated, but like I get the concept, uh, you know, and then we'll encourage them to, you know, walk them through the product and show them how it looks to users, the end user banner experience. And then, you know, if it seems like a, a good potential fit, then we'll, we'll see if they'll do a proof of concept. And in the proof of concept, usually, you know, those last two to four weeks, usually in the first week, we can show them a bunch of fish we caught. And that's just yeah. incredible value right there. If they see, hey, this is stuff that got through my incumbent system, Inky flagged it, I'm looking at it, and it's clearly fish, <laughs> right? Yeah. That's pretty compelling. Now, are you also running tests, right? Sending, sending um, test phishing emails to employees to see if this were real, you, this person would have been um, this person would have fallen victim to a phishing scam. Yeah, that's, that's called phishing awareness training. We don't do that. Um, okay. We kind of, there are companies that do that um, and we recommend people run that kind of phishing awareness training because it does create a sense of, I like to say paranoia about email. You yeah. know, because basically you can't really trust the identity of any email sender. It's, it's, and the reason for that is email is a really old standard. It dates back to literally 1971 and it predates a lot of the modern authentication controls that are built into protocols like Slack. So you can't really know for sure whether a mail is from somebody, especially if you're a human recipient, how are you supposed to know? Mm -hmm. You basically get a mail that looks like it's from Microsoft and all you can do is kind of look at the domain name and say, well, does that look like a real Microsoft domain name? What if it's Microsoft-Secure-Mail.com? I mean, that's plausible. But it turns yeah. out, no, that's not real. Some guy just registered that domain last week. You know, yeah. you're kind of stuck as a human trying to figure this out. But phishing awareness training is really good to do to to get people to understand. Yeah, just don't trust the identity of a sender of mail. And if mail's trying to ask you to do something like send all the W twos, maybe don't do that. <laughs> you know, confirm outside of email somehow. 
Right. Um, you know, and, and Inky puts yellow banners to warn people like, hey, don't do this based on an email. Don't wire money just because of an email. This looks like a wire request. Um, you know, so what we do, though, is we do the have the machines identify the phishing and proactively block it before it gets to the inbox. So okay. so our thing is not so much about sending synthetic training examples. It's much more about blocking the real stuff. And of course, we do have immense amounts of statistics that we share with our customers about what did we block, who clicked on what, you know, so there's right. some of the same kinds of metrics apply here. Um, but we kind of see them as two different, two different product categories, the phishing awareness training versus what we would call mail protection. Yeah. Well, and one of the things I, 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 that you mentioned that was, was really interesting is in the customer conversation, you're alluding to, Hey, look, the power, the, the, the product is powered by AI. But that's not a huge sticking point for the customer, right? Um, what the customer right. really cares about is the result that you, the problem they have exactly. and the result you get uh, for them. Exactly, and as I mentioned earlier, if anything, AI and ML in cybersecurity is a bit of a uh, negative because yeah. they're hearing it so much and so often it's not real. So, I mean, yeah. I always, when I talk to a CISO, I always say, you're going to roll your eyes, but I will use AI and machine learning. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, so and, I and guess. Then, and then let me tell you how it works. So you believe yeah. what we're doing because there's substance to it. That's one reason why we share the intuition about how it works because we want people to know we're not just using that as a buzzword. We actually do interesting stuff here and it works. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. Very, you know, it, it, it's interesting because it, because it is such a bud buzzword, people try to sell based on AI capabilities. But as a buyer, you're you're. I don't care if it's static code. I don't care. Exactly. If it's a consultant. <laughs> exactly. I don't care. You know, just fix the problem, right? Okay. Yeah, and you know, and further to that point, you know, I think CISOs uh, are well aware that AI comes with negatives. One of which is, as I mentioned, false positives and false negatives, right. and even sometimes intelligibility of what the AI is doing. So. Mm -hmm. You know, again, giving people intuition about how this stuff works helps allay their concern that it's just a black box and even we don't know how it works. We do know how it works because it's not, you know, it's not an opaque system to us and we're willing to share that information with customers so they also have the comfort that we have control over what this thing's doing. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. And I know we're coming up on, on time here. I want to be mindful of your time. Just a couple more questions. Sure. Um, one, for your organization, right? How do you think about, you know, so one of the biggest issues for AI driven companies is the access to talent. How do you think about scaling your organization from that, from a, from a, from a talent perspective? Mm -hmm. uh, and then I'll save the, the, the final question for when you finish. Yeah. The, you know, the talent acquisition problem in AI is really severe because of course the most sought after people in all of software development right now are, you know, machine learning experts, data curators, you know, all the people that you need to work on this stuff. I think, you know, obviously, if you look at the most successful companies of all time, you know, certainly in the last few decades, they were all about making hiring a core competence. So, mm -hmm. so you know, and at ITA, the previous company, the flight search company I mentioned, we did that. We basically had in-house recruiters that worked with external recruiters we spent 10 to 20% of our time every week on hiring yep. 10 to 20% of our time. Think about that. So yeah. Yeah, if you're a developer, <laughs> you're a developer and you're spending 10 to 20% of your time on hiring, your first inclination is to stop doing that because you're quote wasting time and you're not getting your code written. That's not how we approached it. We approached it as this is the investment that's going to make us really, really strong. The other phrase that we used to characterize hiring as a core competence for ourselves was one that, Jeremy Wertheimer, who is our founder and CEO, <laughs> kind of coined, which was, can we hire new people without lowering the class average? Right? In other words, yes. <laughs> you know, A hires, A, A players hire A players. Don't hire B and C players. Even if you're desperate to hire people, wait until you get people who are, who are the same caliber of the current team and never let the class average go down. That requires a real commitment to a disciplined hiring process. Yep, yep. Okay. Yeah, that's helpful. You guys are kind of flipping on its head this idea of hire quickly, fire quickly. It's kind of. I think you have to do. I think you have to also fire quickly. You can't be perfect, and I think uh, that's important. But I think it's much better to have a really tight upfront process. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, and last question for you. Uh, knowing everything you know now um, about how you built your business, the pains you've gone through, the challenges you've overcome, um, if you had to start over from scratch and build back up to the point where you are now, what would you do in your first 90 days? That's a really good question. I mean, I think one thing I would definitely do much earlier than I did in any of the companies, well, I guess the game company is a bit different example, but I would, I would find a partner in the business who is a veteran salesperson for that sector. Um, I think, especially nowadays, you know, when we did ITA circa 1999, we put up a flight planning website that was just free. We just put it out there and a million people used it. Like we got a million users. There was a 90 second mention of it on NPR and a million people came to that site and started using it. Now you can't get a hundred users, right? <laughs> it's like everything is just hyper competitive, getting attention, getting people to know you exist, getting customers. So everything about marketing and sales has to be done in a much more sophisticated way now for you to have any, any chance of success. So I think if I were doing a new startup, certainly if it were in a new vertical, a new area, I would think very early on about how do I identify that person who's done the sales playbook for that space before um, and, and, get, and get them in early. That's yeah. hard because usually salespeople like work on commission. So if you're not selling anything yet, they're like, why, would, <laughs> why do I want to be here? Um, yeah. So I'm not saying it's easy, but I think, you know, trying to look, you know, because when Google started, Google and ITA started around the same time, those companies, like, they didn't really have to worry about sophisticated sales and marketing. They just didn't. Right. It was just not competitive yet, you know, and it was a lot easier to get attention for internet things. They were new. Um, it's just a whole different level. Uh, so I think you have to think holistically about go to market and product market yeah. fit. And this is coming from the perspective of, you know, can correct me if I'm wrong here, but you as a product person, right? It's going to make it easier. Your go-to-market strategy, your first customer, first 10 customers, it's going to make it that much easier for you because you have someone with that level of expertise or even subject matter expertise that knows how to get into the door of folks that, you know, you ultimately want to have this long-term relationship with. Right. And, and exactly as you said, you know, you kind of posed the question in the beginning. Well, if you're supposed to ask people for what you should build, how do you talk to them? How do you get them to talk to you? Well, that's sales. <laughs> it's a different right. kind of sales. But if you have somebody who can be a partner in your business that has the Rolodex, as they say, they can call up somebody who's a CISO in, in our space or wh whoever, you know, VP of whatever in your other spaces. And they're willing to hear the pitch. Right. Like that's just invaluable. But if you're a programmer like me, a technical guy, like how do you get that? <laughs> you get that. Yeah. That's a sales job. That's not a programming job, right? Yeah, so. yeah. And, and I guess it would be the opposite, right? If you were coming from the perspective of, look, I have thousands of contacts in, a, in a, one particular industry. I'm great with relationships and the understanding of this particular industry. I need someone who could build out product. They'd probably be looking for you. Right. Exactly. Their first step, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Very helpful. Very helpful. Um, anything else, you know, one or two learning lessons that, that, that would have helped you out greatly in that first 90 days? One thing that I've found too, is when you're building that really early team, it's very important to understand the personality type of the people you're hiring. And the real key is, most people are not comfortable with massive amounts of uncertainty. Hmm. And so if you're in an early stage startup, it is massively uncertain. And, and the, the typical person that you will hire will be deeply uncomfortable with that. And that will be a lingering problem until they either leave or you get big enough. So you're, you're a lot more certain. So I think when you're looking for the early team, the first five or 10, it's really important to test and, and, understand like what's their appetite for risk and not even just risk but like total uncertainty like you might change the whole business plan next week right. right that's the way it is in the first 90 days or even year of an early stage startup and that's deeply uncomfortable for a lot of people who are otherwise really good employees who'd be great contributors 
Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, thanks for that help. Um, assuming I'm a, a, I'm a potential customer, where can we find you? Inky.com. You can go visit us at Inky.com. We've got all kinds of great stuff on there about fishing, really interesting papers on, you know, here's the different tactics we're seeing attackers use, how we combat them. Uh, you know, and you can fill out a form, get a demo. Soon you'll be able to come and self-install Inky actually. We're going to have, if you're an admin for your, uh, for your company's mail and you use our 365, you just be able to come and start a trial without even talking to us. So just come to Inky.com. Awesome. Awesome. You heard it here. Inky.com. Check it out. Um, this is definitely a product that, that you will need or should be using if you are uh, on the enterprise side to protect your organization. Um, thank you so much for, for spending some time with us and uh, I look forward to staying in touch with you. You're welcome. Great questions. Really enjoyed it.